Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to our October 10th, 2017 Turnout Tuesday session. Our guest tonight is going to be Cy Lynch, good friend of ours, uh, contributing night to the roundtable at Manifest Investing in our monthly webcast. And we've added these Turnout Tuesday sessions just to take a little bit of a deeper dive into some subjects of interest to all of you. And uh, Cy is going to cover investment risk tonight, uh, this notion of a better understanding. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing. And this session tonight is co-sponsored by a couple chapters of Better Investing and Manifest Investing. And uh, let's go ahead and get some of the legal paperwork out of the way first. Just as a reminder, I'm not sure if Sai will be talking about any specific stocks tonight, but if he does, no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. This is all about education. It's about the philosophy and principles of the modern investment club movement that we all experience through the work of NEIC, Better Investing, or Manifest Investing. And uh, again, everything we do is for education and demonstration. We're very big on demonstration and showing people how to be successful uh, long-term lifetime investors. Um, if you were, have a friend or yourself and you'd like to be added to the reminder list and you're not already on it, you can see that's Natalie Kabula's email address at the bottom and Kabula1 at Comcast.net if you'd like to be added to that. Well, tonight's presenter. He's a dear friend. I think I've known Cy for the better part of 25 years now. Um, He's deeply respected in the long-term investing community, and he's he's been a contributor at the national convention and at a variety of chapters around the country for the investment club and the chapters volunteers nationwide. He's he's written a number of articles for us at Manifest Investing, and he does participate successfully participates as a night of the round table, and he's always talking about that very tough to handle issue of patience especially for some of us that sit around the round table. Um, he's written a, a number of articles. I, I found his article on traditions and honoring traditions, muskrat pageantry to be pretty good. And Rites of Springs is centered around spring training and baseball, believe it or not. That is an Atlanta Braves tie, by the way, in that suit that he's got on on the right there. And then, I, you know, ch Chopping Cows and Analyst Networks, I, I write articles about cow tipping. He writes about some kind of a chopping cow and eating more chicken or something like that. But if you want to take a look at any one of those articles, you can actually access any one of the three at that uh, blog address down at the bottom, a little bit more about who we are and that sort of thing. But for now, uh, one other thing that I should mention is he's recently completed his degree in theology, and he's an active uh, preacher, minister of the faith. And uh, we welcome Cy here tonight to talk to us about risk and in investing. Take it away, Mr. Lynch. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. It's 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 interesting when you say an active preacher and you were talking about the, the length of time we've been uh, friends and uh, uh, you are a dear friend. And, and I remember when, when we met, but one of the um, early encounters that we had back when you were still uh, in your role as uh, uh, editor at Better Investing uh, magazine, and and actually, I think the article I'm thinking of appeared in the uh, Bits, the computer magazine. But mm -hmm. I received uh, uh, the Dutch Shoes Award for investment education online, and uh, talked about the dream of what we're doing tonight: being able to uh, invest or learn about investing 24 hours a day and in your own time and in your own home and in front of your computer and harnessing technology to do that. And uh, uh, the, the topic that I, I uh, spoke on in my uh, acceptance talk was uh, dream with me. And I think you and a few others accused me of sounding like a Southern preacher. <laughs> I think we did. So little did we know that's uh, where we'd end up. Uh, at the time. But uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight and, and welcome everyone. And I hope that uh, uh, we can enjoy ourselves some tonight talking about really one of my favorite investment topics over the last few years, uh, that being uh, risk and what I believe to be a proper view 
of risk. And here's an overview of what we'll be looking at tonight. We'll start by just looking at some common definitions of risk. Uh, poke a few holes in them, see where they fall short. And then we're going to try and move toward a working definition of true risk for us as long-term investors. And then after we do that, we'll look at some ways to seek to minimize this true risk. I'll go ahead and say uh, up front, I have some pretty strong and passionate views on the subject, but I also realize that I'm bucking against Nobel Prize winners and uh, a lot of um, things that people have said for a long time and that we continue to hear over and over. So I may not change some of your minds and that's really not the objective tonight. I just hope that uh, I can get you thinking about risk maybe in a different way. And of course, for some of you who um, have been around Better Investing and Mark and myself and Ken uh, and so forth for a long time, you've heard much of this before and probably uh, this hopefully will tie it together uh, for you. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide, Mark, and start. Here are some of the uh, common definitions uh, of risk. The first one, and this is really what you hear a talking head on TV talking about, you talk to a stockbroker about, and even frequently just in our casual conversation, you talk about risk and you're referring to volatility. Stock prices moving up and down. It's the, I mentioned Nobel Prizes. Uh, the core principle of modern portfolio theory is built around this idea of volatility. If you've ever talked about beta, uh, and you understand even casually what beta refers to, that's a measure of volatility. If you're familiar with Morningstar and risk adjusted returns and so forth, they're adjusting for volatility. So that's probably the most common uh, use of risk and that's the, the definition we're gonna really poke holes at, at least for long-term investors. The Another definition, uh, certainly those of us who have had to sell stocks at losses at some time realize the potential for capital loss. And of course, that can be a real risk, but it's important to distinguish a potential for capital loss from volatility. Just because stocks move up and down, volatility doesn't mean that they're necessarily a potential for capital loss there. And when we get to the part about minimizing our true risk, we'll look at some ways to, to perhaps try and avoid uh, this potential for capital loss. Um, so I'll just ask you, we don't really have good feedback mechanism, but think about how would you define risk? You were right on time, Mark. You can jump to Here's a slide, actually, this goes back to Ron Mullenkamp's presentation uh, at Bank of 2005, but I love the chart and so I continue to use it. Which line is riskiest? Squiggly and up, straight and flat, straight and down. Again, modern portfolio theory tells you that first line is the riskiest line because of the squiggly aspect of it. It's volatile. Next slide. Here is that abstract theoretical hypothetical chart put into real life. You have uh, the, the charts a little small to, to see, uh, but you can see it some uh, in the PDF handouts and, and hopefully on your computer screen uh, can see it. But it, essentially those top two lines are stocks. Small company stocks is the green, greenish line, which is the very top line. The line uh, right below it is the S&P 500 index, large stocks. So those, that's the squiggly and up line. Notice how those lines, especially the green line, tends to have more, more ups and downs uh, than the other lines. Uh, but notice uh, those lines, that's squiggly and up. Those are the stocks and these are adjusted uh, for, uh, in. Let's see, 
I'm just trying to see, are these adjusted for inflation at all? No, I'm sorry, they're not adjusted for taxes or inflation. These are just nominal uh, returns. Didn't you see the uh, red line, which is long-term government bonds? And then you see the um, bottom two lines. The darkest blue is inflation and the lighter blue is treasury bills. You can see that the treasury bill line and the inflation line tend to track each other very much. So that's uh, very much a straight line after taxes, or excuse me, after inflation, and the bonds are just a little bit above inflation. If you include taxes in that, that's where you get bonds are roughly that straight flat line and uh, cash you would actually be losing real purchasing power after taxes and after inflation. So that would be the straight and, and uh, down line. Next slide. First principle that we need to remember, and this is a somewhat of a busy chart, but it's really a, a very simple point that time is on our side. These are the royal, rolling 10 year periods for most of, of uh, the 20th century into the 21st century, uh, starting with 1900 um, going forward. And you can see that only four 10-year periods during that roughly 115-year time frame had actual negative returns during the time. So if you held your stocks for 10 years, you had very little um, opportunity to actually lose money. You see the average return is about 10% that we talk about, and you can see how it's distributed uh, over time. Again, that's volatility uh, picture in a little bit different way of looking at it, but again, shows that the longer you hold stocks, the better your chance of uh, not losing actual capital uh, increases. Next slide. Same, uh, same uh, data looked at in a different manner, slightly different or slightly shorter time period. Again, what's important on this slide that I wanted to show is again, notice greater volatility with small stocks, less volatility with larger stocks, but more than bonds, which then has more volatility than uh, treasury bills. But the key, is look at the uh, compound annual return lines, the uh, straight lines in each of those. 12.1% for small stocks. Moving into large stocks, the S&P 500, you would reduce your return by 2.2% on annual uh, per year. Government bonds, an additional 4.4% and then an additional almost 2%. Uh, reduction in T-bills. So yes, you're getting volatility uh, reduction, but the volatility reduction comes at a cost, and that is a reduced return. Next uh, slide, Mark. So this brings us to our conclusion, number one, which is volatility is not risk for the long-term investor. The longer you hold stock, the less chance that your stock is going to go down in value. And one thing to remember about the slides that we were just looking at is, again, we were looking at market indices as a whole, small companies, large companies, and then, of course, bonds and cash. But we don't buy market indices. We seek to actively manage our portfolio and we buy individual stocks so we can actually both reduce volatility and the potential for long-term capital gain. Some of uh, what Mark and Ken has been working with in sell triggers and so forth has, has been seeking to find ways to minimize this idea of, a capital, of capital losses. And we'll talk a little bit more about some ways to minimize that using better investing tools in the last part of our uh, presentation tonight. But the key point, and if you get nothing else out of tonight, is volatility is not risk. And I'll qualify that for the long-term investor. If you're a day trader, 
If you are even someone with a six month to a year time frame, volatility may in fact be risk for you. That is one reason why talking heads and stock brokers and so forth are so convinced that volatility is risk. If you have a short term time perspective, it can be risk. But for those of us who have long term uh, horizon and are patient, it is not risk. Realize that just a decline in your stock or portfolio value is not a capital loss. I cringed back in 2008, 2009, waking up in the morning and seeing headlines, $2 billion lost in stock market yesterday. And of course, knowing that nobody lost money if they didn't sell. Yes, it's painful to see the portfolio go down, but we know that it can come back up and we'll be looking at that in uh, actually, I think, section after next. Let's move to the next uh, slide, Mark. And before we do, did you have any comment or are there any questions that we want to talk about? No, we're getting a couple of reports of you going in and out a little bit, but not from too many people. Hopefully that has resolved itself. I'm not experiencing that on this end at all. So, so all right. on the technical side, not, nothing related other than some people defining risk as being not reaching your destination or not reaching the objectives that you set for your investing plan. Okay. Uh, Bob, do you want to take over and give the rest of the program? Because you've actually kind of jumped where we're headed. So, uh, good, good segue. That's a, good <laughs> yeah, good, good segue. And, and hold that thought. Here, I've already alluded a little bit about the cost of misunderstanding risk. This is an extremely busy uh, slide, gives you way more invitation. Uh, information than you need uh, unless you're just a complete statistical nut. Um, but it, it again takes a look at annual returns uh, for uh, various allocations of stocks, bonds, and cash uh, over the 30-year um, period from 1986 to 2015, um, moving from 100% stocks, which gives you the greatest average return Again, that stereotypical, we always talk about roughly 10%, and it's interesting how that seems to hold over uh, many time periods uh, since the 1900. Since 1900. Uh, if you look at for an extended period, then a little less for bonds, yeah, less for cash, and then of course, various mixtures of bonds, cash, and stocks. And again, the fewer stocks you hold, the uh, lower your total return average goes down, and then the other lines essentially uh, let you know, again, you're gaining uh, reduced volatility, but you're giving up potential return. Next uh, slide, Mark. This is just a chart. If you don't like graphs and pictures, this gives it to you numerically, but what's also important here is it moves from percentages to what it would have looked like. I first started investing in um, an IRA, putting $2,000 a year into my IRA, which was the uh, maximum contribution at the time in the early 80s. So it just about tracked uh, this particular chart, uh, which began uh, looking in 1986. And you can see that if uh, I had invested $2,000 annually for 30 years from 86 to 215 into um, the S&P 500, I would have had about $353,000. And then you can see each, uh, each lower line adding 10% cash uh, to my stock so that I just have 90% stock. And then the 80% stock line is 80% uh, 80 stock, 10% cash, 10% bonds, and then it goes down 10% cash whatever the percentage for stock is and bonds. And again, you can see that if I had started, let's see, 86, I would have been, what, about 28 years old. So applying that uh, rule of thumb that I really don't know where it ever came from other than just nice math of 100 minus your age being your stock uh, allocation, I would have been around 70% stock. And let's just say I had stayed at 70%. Of course, as I got older, I would have decreased my stock contribution. 
but just decreasing to 70%, I would have left, as you can see there, about $70,000 on the table. So equating volatility with risk cost real dollars. Next slide. So conclusion number two is that treating volatility the same as risk costs. In real dollars, it costs you in reduced purchasing power, especially again after taxes and inflations. Stocks are by far the best returning asset class. And it's really beyond uh, our topic for tonight, and, and we really don't have time to get into it, but what's also important to realize is, is, is if you treat volatility as risk and you reduce your stock exposure, you also have potentially uh, missed opportunities for individual stocks, particularly if you shy away from the more volatile stocks because it's the more volatile stocks that have the greatest potential for giving you long-term capital gains, even though you've got to have the stomach to have some downs. As I mentioned in the slide, volatility works both ways. Now I cringe at the no risk, no reward, or greater the risk, greater the reward, because of course that is back to equating volatility to risk. But if you use the word volatility rather than risk, it does tend to hold. Frequently the most volatile stocks offer the most upside potential. Next slide. I think I'll uh, I'll step in here for just a second, Cy. This this is such an, a powerful thing to understand. I'm I'm often asked, you know, why is the overall performance of the vast majority of mutual fund manor, managers mediocre? This is it. They don't understand this. They're taught some concepts which are flawed, and this is what really messes up a lot of the institutional crowd. And I also experienced this in my advisory work where uh, I have to work with individuals to understand that volatility is not risk and you pay, pay an extremely high price for avoiding volatility. And that's what most of the professional investors and many of the financial planners in the country do. It can be very, very costly. So we'll come back to that, but I just thought I had mentioned that. Thanks, Mark. Excellent. So a couple of more uh, thoughts on volatility. Uh, I've already uh, alluded to uh, volatility presenting opportunity. Of course, one of the foundational better investing principles is invest regularly regardless of the market outlook. And we frequently teach that as an application of dollar cost averaging. The more volatile the stock market or the individual stock. In other words, the more ups and downs the stock has, the more effective dollar cost averaging is. The, the flatter the line for a stock or for an index is, the less effective dollar cost averaging is. Um, so uh, sometime play with your spreadsheet or something and, and work that work that out, but actually this whole idea of dollar cost averaging, when the stock price is high, you buy fewer shares, and when the stock price is low, you buy greater shares so that your average cost per share is lower if you invest regularly rather than purchasing all at one time. Uh, that whole idea of dollar cost averaging, the more volatile the investment, the the better advantage dollar cost averaging gives you. And then I've uh, mentioned Julie's trampoline here. This is Julie Werner, um, one of my and Mark's uh, good friends and fellow educators in the uh, uh, better investing world. She's from uh, Georgia, uh, the Warner Robins area. But she tells the story about how she would never have accomplished her long-term financial goals were it not for the bear markets in 2000 and 2008, and actually I think she was in uh, my class at Bink when I did this and said that I can go ahead and say also back in 1988. She's that old and uh, experienced that down market uh, as well. 
but what happened was she uh, applied one of Mark's principles of when the stock market is down and you can find high quality uh, stocks on sale in a bear market, you back up the truck and you buy them. And so then when you come out of the bear market into the next bull, it's like a trampoline to your portfolio. And so in 1988, buying in in uh, 89 and and even of course then you had the second uh bull or bear in 89 you kind of you got that bounce into the 90s bear market of course then up into the frothy levels of 2000 then you had the crash again in 2001 2002 that gave you a chance then again think of the trampoline going down but now the spring bouncing your portfolio up and then of course the same thing happening in 2008 2009 so that's a, a another example of how volatility presents opportunity for long-term investors next slide mark here's another potential definition of risk from warren buffett risk comes from not knowing what you're doing i think that that's a pretty good um definition of risk and i think we're all uh on this uh call tonight trying to learn more about what we're doing and in reduce our risk by knowing more about what risk is and how it's not volatility next slide uh, this this slide uh is just talking about uh, how individual investors have unperformed, underperformed. It's, it's a slide from Raymond James. There's various studies uh, that have looked at the reasons why typical individual investors um, do worse than the market averages here you see over the uh, time uh, period uh, from uh, 88 through 2008, uh, that 20-year period, the S&P 500 was up 8.4 percent yet the average stock fund investor only uh, uh, gained 1.9 percent and they track this by looking at mutual fund inflows and outflows and of course what they've learned is that rather than buying low and selling high we tend to buy high and sell low and that is an example of the not knowing uh, what we're doing and i'll go ahead and mention level three investing uh, at this point jim clunan uh, founder of the uh, american association of individual investors has written a book it's about a year old now i think called level three investing and he really hammers this particular point about volatility not being risk for the long-term investor hammers it home and gives way more data even than i've shown in this presentation tonight. And he talks about things, but what, what I wanted to mention about him and his ideas in this context of Warren Buffett's definition of risk, not knowing what we're doing, his three levels of investing. Level one is the way most people invest, which is no plan. You just go in, you, you say, gee, I heard that Mark Robertson was making a lot of money in the stock market, so I'm gonna go start buying stocks. And of course, normally I'm going to buy stocks at the very worst time if I do it that way. Of course, I see my value go down. I say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose my retirement. And so I sell. And that's the way most people invest. That's the average stock fund investor that you have here. Then level two investing is the modern portfolio theory where you develop uh, models based on volatility being risk. You develop models based on what, you, you know, what is your risk level? Can you take 10% decline in value, 20% decline in value, that sort of thing. And you, you come up with these asset allocations to seek to reduce your volatility and to come up with a longer term financial plan based on asset allocation it's going to tend to give you a better return than level one investing which is no plan but as we've already seen some examples it's not as good as level three investing which is understanding 
uh, that stocks are where your money should be and some of the applications that we'll get to uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so of the presentation tonight. Now, uh, Clunan actually, when he gets into what level three looks like, gets a lot into mutual funds and, and uh, kind of gets into some things that, that not all of us would agree on, uh, but what's important to remember is level one is no plan. Level two is better, but it's a flawed plan. It's the one that financial professionals use. And then level three is very much the manifest better investing long-term buying good quality companies selling at good values. Next slide. And here are some of the mistakes investors tend to make. Of course, I would disagree with not paying enough attention to asset allocation being a mistake because I say pay no attention to asset allocation. But that's again, they're coming at it from this uh, modern portfolio theory uh, idea. But notice what they get into trying to time the market, buying overvalued investments. Um, I'd say in my experience working with investment clubs and so forth, uh, those two are, are probably the biggest flaws, perhaps the buying overvalued. Again, we, we get excited about a stock and uh, maybe we let our quality standards or our valuation standards uh, relax a little bit and, and buy stocks a little bit high. Uh, not really quality standards as much as, as uh, valuation standards. Uh, next slide. So just continuing uh, with this idea of, of risk being not knowing what we're doing, failing to plan. We heard the cliche that if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So if you don't have a me investing methodology, get one. But then the next problem is uh, that frequently we get scared and we don't stick with our plan. Again, that's one good thing that Better Investing and NAIC, and I know many of uh, the people on this call, we've been through ups and down markets, and we do believe in our plan and stick with it. But those were lessons we've had to learn with experience and learn by listening uh, to others. But again, most of our friends and people who aren't in the investment club movement, uh, that, that's that's not second nature to them. So let's take a look at some of the costs of not sticking with the plan. Here's just the um, last bear market. You see the uh, market highs at uh, 2008. This is the um, total market index fund, the Vanguard total index fund. It's the Wilshire uh, 5000, trying to track the uh, market as a whole. Notice that Anybody who sold after June 2008 was worth worse off than people who just held for uh, a little over three years. Just again, looking at the market as a whole. Next slide. Notice the opportunity that you lost as we move from that 2011 time frame, and notice that uh, the market actually bounced around after 2011, which was that previous slide, and stayed relatively flat and didn't really fully recover uh, till March of 2013 using the Wilshire 5000. So almost a five year, about four and a half to five year time frame for the market to recover. Hold that four and a half to five years in the back of your mind, we'll come back to it. But again, if you were out of the market, in uh, early 2013, you can see as the, the market continued up, you lost the opportunity to buy back in and to gain um, to, to gain the appreciation. Uh, and then of course the markets continued to go up since this slide. Next slide. So conclusion number three, not having a plan's costly. And this is back to where we really started about the capital loss and volatility not being the same thing, but price declines aren't capital losses, but panicking and not following your plan can be costly. Selling turns 
harmless declines in value into costly capital losses. Uh, I've uh, given a presentation on turbulent markets, and we we spend an hour looking at these sorts of, of slides, and you've already seen a little bit of it in the early slides, but a line that I, I use and repeat coming out of those classes is long-term, the bears, which look really deep and really hard when you're in the middle of it, over time become blips. Bears become blips. And uh, that you need to, again, just ingrain that thought process so that you don't turn price declines into real losses, which that is a genuine element of risk. Any comments, Mark? No, I've always enjoyed your bear markets become blips and your your efforts to encourage us to recognize the difference between temporary turbulence and terminal conditions when it comes to that issue. So it's it's definitely it, it's tough though. I mean, when the market's down, <laughs> it's hard. And uh, it is. You know, I had a long discussion one time with uh, Mark Halbert on the subject and how our community seems to have a degree of immunity to some of the fear and despair. And I, I think a lot of it revolves around the fact that we develop expectations. Therefore, when that market's down and our fundamentals are still intact, those return forecasts give us faith. They give us something to have some uh, faith in tomorrow. And the, when the return forecasts go up and the fundamentals remain strong, it, it's one of the ways that our discipline is maintained, I believe. I I think you're exactly right, and and it it's a little bit of a rabbit, but I'll chase it for ten seconds. Uh, I've I uh, have repeatedly said I don't use price zones, and I don't really concern myself too much with low price projections on um, the stock selection guide. However, I think one important aspect of the low price expectation on the stock selection guide is that when you wake up after, but you buy a stock today, you wake up and the stock is down 10% tomorrow and your projected potential low price is 20 and that 10% drop is it dropped to 30, you can comfortably say, I knew that was possible. And I took that into account in my my analysis and therefore I should not be surprised and don't panic and sell. Yep. And and so I, I, I like what you, you said about the expectations and while I think there's some real problems with zoning and so forth, but that's, uh, uh, I know people who are strong advocates of, of that low, low price. That's, that's one valid point I think that they make is that, that that's a good expectation to keep in mind. All right, next slide. Hi guys, while you're, Switching slides, uh, Cy, I also think that our emphasis on a relative return uh, gives us a little bit of cushion against despondency as well. Yes, absolutely does. That's like an unabashed commercial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank, thank you and welcome, Ken. Yes, thank I'm you. I'm glad Ken. to be here. And 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 you're you're exactly right. Uh, that's that's a wonderful thing to return or to remember is that when the market is going down and you're going down less than the market, you're doing good. So don't get despondent uh, over it. All right. Um, we're shifting now. We've, we've kind of looked at some um, general ideas, volatility not being risk. Volatility is not the same thing as capital loss, although market downs or, or falls in declines in stock prices can become losses if you sell. Uh, and then the importance of having a plan and sticking with it uh, to reduce true risk for a long-term investor. Now we're going to start looking at some ways to reduce this downside potential. And uh, here's a favorite of, of Mark's uh, for a long time. And uh, it's, it's one of mine as well. Size matters. Here are three uh, mutual funds. Small cap is the uh, black line. 
uh, middle cap is the blue line, and then the gold line is the large cap or the S&P 500. Notice that uh, the uh, smaller company index funds tend to have a little bit more risk. Oops, did I screw up and say that? I meant volatility. Yet they also have more uh, potential return. So size does matter. Notice the difference between over this 10-year uh, period between uh, the S&P 500, which returned about 70%, while the mid cap and small cap were around 120. So significant difference depending on what size stocks you were invested in. Next slide. Again, taking advantage of upside volatility. That was something we mentioned earlier on. This compares uh, the total stock market, which is the black line, with the S&P 500, which is the gold line, they're going to tend to track very closely because even though uh, the total stock market tracks 7,000 stocks versus only 500 for the S&P, uh, something called market cap weighting, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a slide or two, uh, but we don't have a lot of time to go into it in depth, um, really makes the total stock market in the S&P 500 very much driven by the same 10 to 20 stocks. But notice, and here's the key, uh, and I guess I'll mention it some on this slide, uh, the value line arithmetic, which is the blue line, has more volatility, but look at the tremendous difference in return coming out of the uh, 2000 uh, crash and bear market. But what's important about that blue line are two things. One, it's a mixture of companies. In other words, it's not just large companies like the gold line. So that's lesson one. Mixing up company sizes gives you more potential for return. But the other thing is it actually has a mixture of companies like that black line does. But what's the difference between the two of them? It's that market cap weighting. The value line arithmetic is based on the 2,700 stocks uh, covered in the value line main edition. And while arithmetic weighting isn't quite equal weighting, it's essentially taking those 2,700 companies and buying equal amounts of them and rebalancing periodically. The black line and the gold line are market cap weighted funds and they're going to largely be driven by companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, at one time General Motors, Exxon, uh, because they are actually market cap weighted and so the larger the company the more impact on the index it has. So that's an important thing for us as individual investors and one reason again that volatility isn't necessarily risk we can pick from any of the 7,000 or 2,700 value line companies or for that matter even the 500 S&P companies we don't have to buy the market we can buy individual companies and uh, balance them the way our stock analysis leads us to do next slide Um, this is just a reiteration of the uh, market cap weighting size matters. This is two S&P 500 indexes. What's the difference? Why does the gold line return about 50% over this 10-year period, while the black line returns 30% greater? They're the identical 500 companies. The reason is the spider um, ETF, which is the gold line, is that market cap weighting that I mentioned. The bigger the company is, the greater an impact on the uh, index. The black line is the uh, rider equal weighted S&P 500, which is taking equal amounts of each of the 500 companies. In other words, each company <coughs> is, uh, 
is roughly 0.2% of the portfolio rebalanced quarterly. And so even when you're talking about large companies, if you take that mega cap effect out, you can increase your return buying the same 500 companies, but spreading it out. So you can reduce your volatility and your potential downside risk by buying companies of different sizes, which is something that, that Ken and Mark continually encourage us to take a look at. Size does matter. Next slide. Mark? Yep, but that should be the next one. Oh, is that the, yep. oh, okay, I'm sorry, yes. I, it It's the same colors and I I had glanced down to the question box and I, I missed it. This is the same, same um, uh, principle that we've been talking about, except this is moving from the cap weighting uh, alone, but adding more stocks. This is the value line arithmetic, which is a non-market cap weighted, but also adding an additional 2,200 companies to the mix. And as you can see, again, more volatility, but also more potential return. And I guess I'll sneak into doing on a best commercial too. That's why right now, I mean, for the last month or so and continuing through Halloween, we're out there searching for promising uh, small, in medium-sized companies to possibly do some shopping. And uh, you guys have been helpful. If you find a good one, let us know. Because, again, that black line is all of the above investing, small, medium, and large. And that's why we always want to be placing a, a fair amount of emphasis on seeking, discovering, small, promising small and medium-sized companies to add to our mix. Right. And I'll go ahead and just mention, since we've got that slide up and you, you mentioned that, Mark, is this is, is, again, you will hear pundits saying small companies are riskier than large companies. And I would say based on this slide and based on what we've built up in the last 45 minutes, that ain't so. Yes, small companies can be more volatile, but they're not riskier if you properly define risk for a long-term investor. All right, next slide. Uh, Cy, while we have just a short break there, uh, we have a question from Ralph, and he wants to know, can you give ETF equivalents for the equal weight and the cap-weighted S&P 500 uh, indexes? Uh, the, the, um, uh, here are the, the equal weight ETF is RSP, which is, uh, it, it used to be, the company was called Ryder. It's now a German. It's been purchased. It's Guggen Guggenheim. And it's Guggenheim, there you go. Purchased again by Invesco. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, but, but the ticker is still RSP. And there are a, a number of with Guggenheim slash Invesco uh, and dating back into Ryder's. There are some equal weighted sector funds, but there's still not a whole lot of equal weight funds out there. And then one example of the uh, ETF uh, for market cap weighted S&P 500 is also on this slide, SPY, which is the spider. Another one that I tend to use, although it's the total stock market, although it behaves very much like um, the um, uh, SPY is VTI, which is the Vanguard. Um, and then what is the Vanguard 500 market cap weighted? Do either of y'all know off the top of your head? VDI, is that? Uh, oh, <laughs> Oh, the, I'm drawing well, a blank. Well, the Vanguard um, market weighted one for the for the S and P 500 is V F I N X. Uh, right, that's the mutual fund. That's the mutual fund. And then, and then there's an ETF equivalent of VTSMX. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, I think I see a question. Is there an ETF for value line? I'm not familiar with an ETF for value line. There isn't. We've, been, tr we've been trying to persuade somebody to do it. We won't stop, but <laughs> we, we're hoping yeah. that somebody someday will build one. 
Yep, and unfortunately, while Value Line does have mutual funds, um, I believe they still market them. They are more actively managed. They are not index funds. They're based on the the timeliness rankings. So so you can't even as a mutual fund as opposed to an ETF. While there are Value Line funds, they do not track that arithmetic index. All right. Um, this is, uh, I, I think we haven't talked about this slide. This is just looking, uh, we were looking at coming out of the uh, 2000 bear market and looking at the opportunity. This is looking at going into the um, bear market in uh, 2008, 2009. And again, you see that the equal weighted black line is more volatile than the uh, gold line, but again, uh, ultimately the downside works out about the same. And we've been looking at the upside and you need to keep the upside and the downside together. Um, but this is a market low to market low um, for the S&P 500s. Next slide. Uh, and this is the value line uh, arithmetic index with the spider again from market low to market low and again you see tremendous upside potential during the bull market and this particular slide with a few more stocks mixed in notice even after the um, full extent of the latest bear market um, the value line was doing about 20 percentage points better than the um, S&P 500 fund. Next slide. So here are uh, two more conclusions for us. Holding companies of various sizes. And again, uh, this is Mark's contribution to my investment philosophy. And I think Mark's contribution to our um, portfolio construction dynamic is measuring company size not by market cap, or by sales, but by growth rates. Um, and that reduces the downside potential and it increases our upside potential. Again, better investing, NAIC has long suggested 25% lar uh, large, 25% small, and 50% middle uh, companies. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that rule of thumb. I personally don't get terribly wrapped up in that. I just say, make sure you have all three. And uh, uh, it's going to balance out over time because there are going to be times that the best opportunities are large companies. Other times, the best opportunities are small companies. And um, so, so don't get hung up on the percentages, but make sure you have all three uh, sizes. Next slide. And this will be kind of our, our uh, we're, we're moving into our home stretch or sliding into home to use the uh, baseball analogy. Um, I'm going to refresh your memory and supplement the information a little bit on recovery times because I've been harping on don't engage in asset allocation. It's costly. And when I say asset allocation, I'm talking about mixing stocks, cash, and bonds purely for, quote, diversification reasons. There are, however, completely legitimate and, in fact, vital reasons to hold bonds or cash in a portfolio for reasons other than asset allocation in the traditional sense. And, in fact, it does help reduce our risk the way that long-term investors properly can understand risk. And that's where we're going now. Take a look at recovery times. From the um, uh, early 2000 bear market, uh, using uh, this is using the total stock market. It uh, peaked in uh, June of uh, uh, 2001 and then fell. And notice it recovered by November of 2004. Uh, value line was about 26 months that it ended up uh, recovering. A little bit slower for the uh, VTI or the total stock market 
cap weighted fund, it actually extended out there uh, closer to uh, four, looks like four and a half years uh, there, but value line was 26 months. So somewhere in the two to, uh, I said four and a half, three and a half years, I meant the 41 months for the market as a whole um, using market cap, value line was about 26 months. So again, two years to three and a half years to recover coming out of the 2000 bear market. Next slide. Coming out of the 2007 bear market, the market as a whole took a little over five years, almost five and a half years to recover. Again, the value line mix size company, remember, we're reducing our risk by holding companies of different sizes. And uh, while it's more volatility, we get less capital loss uh, potential going in. And, the, and most importantly, we get more capital gains potential coming out. And value line again runs in that 22 to three year recovery time frame. So that's taking a look at the last two bear markets. Next slide. And this generally holds if you go back in time. In reality, if you go back to uh, bear markets in uh, the 80s, which is the, the previous uh, bear market, and then uh, the 1974 bear market, and then going back, you'll actually see faster recovery times. The we have actually seen more extended bear markets uh, in recent history. So the total market tends to recover in three and a half to five and a half years. If you hold mixed size companies, your recovery period is about two to three years. Now, why does this matter? If you are a 30 year old or a 20 year old looking to invest for retirement, and so your horizon is 30 or 40 years, it doesn't matter. Invest in good quality, mixed size companies, selling at good values and be 100% invested in stocks basically is your best investment approach. But when you're the age of me and Mark and Ken and many on this call and we're looking at perhaps needing funds in the next X number of years, and X is going to vary from individual to individual, then that's where these market recovery times come into play. Anywhere between about two years to five and a half years is the market recovery time. I, again, I mentioned earlier about seeing headlines saying $2 billion or $4 billion in stock value lost during the 2008, 2009 bear market. I also, read sad stories about people whose stock portfolio went down in value and they said, now I can't retire next year like I planned. And while I felt for the people and very honestly wanted to cry for them, I wanted to cry for the misinformation. Because if they were looking at using investments 12 months out, that money should never have been in the stock market. That's where bonds and cash come in. So next slide. So let's wrap things up. What is true risk for the long-term investor? And yes, I maybe left that sad person hanging a little bit, but we'll get back to them in just a second. As um, uh, I think it was Bob um, said early on, True risk for a long-term investor is the failure to achieve one's financial goals. There are a number of ways you can do it. You can get insufficient return, and that may be caused because you misunderstand volatility and risk as being the same thing, and so you're holding <coughs> bonds in your portfolio and you're giving up potential return because you buy into the myth that volatility and risk is the same thing. It's also loss of purchasing power because of taxes and inflation. But then there's a big one, and this is the one that I think we don't talk a lot about in our portfolio management classes, uh, is being forced to sell when the market is down. 
that's that person that I just talked about in 2009 saying, gee, I can't retire next year because my portfolio went down too much in value. They're being forced to sell when the market's down. Next slide. True risk in the SSG. From a portfolio standpoint, reduce your risk by owning companies of various sizes. Stock selection guide, just the same old thing we've always taught and always done. Pay close attention to quality. Take a look at consistency in earnings and in sales in particular. That reduces your risk of capital loss. That's, of course, your first two factors of quality rating at manifest investing, relative uh, growth rates, relative profitability. Uh, so that take a look at those things. That helps reduce volatility and risk. Uh, base your value conclusions on total return because it focuses on what really matters. Don't get hung up on uh, value conclusions based on just simply price zone or things like P.E. Uh, ratios compared to historical or so forth. So how might P.E. ratios uh, work in the uh, stock uh, selection guide world? I still do look at P.E. ratios some, but I don't use them as a value metric or as a buying or selling criteria. I look at it as a confidence factor. If there is room for PEs to increase, PE expansion is possible, then that gives me more confidence that my uh, long-term relative return projections can be achieved. And I'm, I'm not as concerned about volatility. On the other hand, if I'm buying a company at a very high current PE relative to its history, even though I think that its earnings are growing fast enough or profitability is increasing fast enough that I can still achieve my return, I have to realize if market sentiment changes, I'm going to have a price hit. So that's why I call PE is a confidence factor, not so much of a value metric. And then upside downside ratio has nothing to do with real risk. And for purposes tonight, since we're pretty much out of time, we'll just say because risk has nothing to do with volatility for long-term investors. And by and large, upside-downside ratio measures volatility. There are some other issues on upside-downside ratio, but we'll leave that for another day. Next class or slide. So getting back to not having to sell when the market's down, how do you properly use cash or bonds in a portfolio. Um, one way to do it is what I like to call the bucket method, where you hold your investments in various pools of funds, various buckets. And to do that, you need to determine two things. First of all, how many years of risk-free funds you need. If you need money, in the next, generally for most people, is going to fall in the next three to five years based on those market recovery times that we looked at earlier, then you take that money, treat that as your safety zone, calculate how much you need during that time frame, and then you invest that in non-volatile investments, principally cash or bonds. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, and obviously cash is one option. Another option that I have personally used and, and have recommended to uh, clients in my advising days is, is laddering U.S. treasuries using zero coupon bonds. And actually, if I need, let's say that I need money to live on in 2018, I may have then some January 2018 zero coupon bonds that if I need $80,000 in 2018 to live on, I'll have $80,000 in bonds maturing January of 2018. And if I need that same 80 in 2019, 
19, same thing and so forth. That's why it's called a, a ladder. You can do the same thing with cash, but even in this low interest rate environment, you can get a little bit more with um, uh, laddering uh, bonds. And uh, the advantage of zero coupons uh, it gives you a little bit more return and again, also guarantee you know exactly what your uh, end amount will be, although you also know that with non-zero uh, coupon, with regular coupon bonds, but um, zero coupon is just a little more convenient. And then you invest the rest of your portfolio in stocks, mixing company sizes. Next slide, which I think is our summary slide. Don't buy the myth that volatility and risk are the same thing. Don't be risky by not understanding what you're doing. As Warren Buffett says, learn our better investing manifest long-term investment, um, uh, investment program principles, own companies of various sizes, focus on total return, not other value metrics. And then as you get nearer needing funds for all sorts of purposes. And it's not always retirement. It can be buying a house. It can be funding education. Um, one time in, in my particular life was when Barb was uh, on active duty in the Army in the mid-2000s. We needed to buy plan to buy back into her retirement plan at work. Uh, so we set aside some funds to do that, um, maybe support parents or support children, all, all sorts of things. But determine what cash you need and uh, then set that aside in your safety zone so that you're not being forced to sell investments when they're down. And I think that's our last slide, isn't it, Mark? Yep. Yep. So that's it. All right, we are just a little bit over an hour. I think what we'll do is go ahead and shut down the, the broadcast. But first of all, Cy, on behalf of a grateful nation, I want to uh, thank you for making this presentation on risk. I think it's a very provocative and compelling topic and I hope that uh, the members of our community are nudged to uh, understand it and embrace what it means in the realm of long-term investing. So thank you very much for, for this presentation. Thanks for having me, Mark and Ken.